Hi, welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. I'm filming today from Chicago. I'll be in the States and in Toronto this week um, and back in Israel for another episode next week. But uh, for now, I'm here uh, stateside and uh, North America side, uh, for that matter, for a week. Um, and a uh, lot of strategic developments this week. Uh, regionally, President Biden landed in Ukraine for a surprise visit on Monday, which is when I'm taping. Uh, met with Zelensky. Um, I, Iran uh, allowed a IAEA, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency inspector, to uh, see that they have enriched uranium to 84% uh, purity, which is basically weapons grade, which is 90%. So Iran decided this week to tell the world that uh, they are effectively a nuclear power. Um, and that's going to, of course, uh, cause. Um, uh, some significant developments in the future. So my guest today is my friend and colleague from Asia Times, David Goldman. He's been on before to talk about it. His analysis of Ukraine from the outset was prescient and as as we see today, uh, correct. Um, and so we're going to talk about those strategic developments. But before I turn it over to the conversation uh, with David, um, this day, today, uh, the 21st of February, uh, 2023, the uh, Rosh Chodesh of the, the first of the month of Adar in the Jewish calendar is a historic day in Israel. The Knesset passed uh, first reading of uh, two laws on judicial reform uh, in the Knesset. And with their passage, they'll start negotiating in a significant way with any opposition members who are willing to sit down and acknowledge the legitimacy of both the election results and of the legislative process. Um, but I think we have to just sit back for a second and relish this day because it's historic. Today was the first day in Israel's history where the right has actually taken steps to assert governing power away and, and wrest it away from our entrenched bureaucracy, Israel's deep state, much more powerful uh, than the American deep state, even as, um, I mean, in terms of its power nationally. Um, and uh, this is the first step that's ever been taken by a right-wing government to wrest power away and give the power to determine the course of the Jewish state to the elected officials, to the elected leaders of the Jewish state in the Knesset and in the government. This is a really big deal. Menachem Begin got a lot of flack, and rightly, I think, from uh, his, uh, his supporters on the right in the Likud, both during his premiership and then afterwards, uh, and in subsequent years and decades since uh, Begin took power, which was that he, after 29 years in the political wilderness, he finally took power, but he turned around and let all of the uh, bureaucrats in uh, Israel's permanent government remain in, pa remain in power, uh, whether it was in the legal fraternity or the most prominent example was in the state uh, media. Um, he never seized governing authority. He never, uh, he never brought in his own people to run the government. He always let the other side do it. And I think that when you you look at it, you can see that it was a mistake, but you can also see why he did it. Begin didn't have problems uh, with the fact that the Israeli elites opposed him. He was used to it. I mean, that had been the case since well before the founding of Israel in 1948. Um, but uh, on the other hand, in 1977, the left was still Zionist. It was patriotic. It, it was loyal. And so they might have wanted Begin not to be in power, but they didn't they weren't going to do anything to undermine Israel and Israel's national security. That isn't the case anymore. Uh, over the intervening 40 years since then, um, the left in Israel has become increasingly radicalized and anti-Zionist, or at least post-Zionist, and the fulcrum of that radicalization has been the Supreme Court of Israel. Um, through the judicial revolution, that uh, the uh, former president of the Supreme Court, Aaron Barak, enacted uh, between 1992 and 1995, when the Supreme Court seized for itself, arrogated the power to overturn Knesset laws, and then in subsequent years seized more and more governing powers from the government 
and legislative powers from the Knesset and except no limits on its powers that it had arrogated it to itself without legal basis, um, that process of arrogating the powers of Israel's elected officials uh, also engendered a radicalization of the courts. By ending standing requirements in the courts, Barack invited what became a cottage industry of non-governmental organizations that were formed, uh, political organizations operating under the aegis of human rights to undermine government policies, to undermine Jewish uh, uh, sovereignty, uh, Israel's, Israel's identity as a Jewish state, and a whole host of domestic and strategic issues. Um, and those NGOs are funded in large measure by foreign governments who the largely from Europe, but also from the United States, also the United States that are engaged in a political war against Jewish statehood, Jewish nationalhood, Jewish nation, Jewish nationalism and um, Zionism. And uh, so a report that just came out from Im Tzu, uh, which is a uh, nationalist, a Zionist student organization in Israel, they uh, just published a report that was uh, covered uh, by Channel 14 News. And what they found was the depth of foreign funding of the self-proclaimed civil rights or human rights organizations that have petitioned the court hundreds of times every year. Um, and so what they found was that the funding of these organizations from 2017 to 2022, uh, just for, I think it was, uh, 32 organizations. Uh, it reached 300 million shekels. That's nearly $100 million of foreign government money that went into these organizations to undermine, to gum up the works, as one of them referred to it, of the Israeli government by petitioning the court against every national security decision effectively that the, that the government made, that the army is makes, uh, laws that the Knesset passes that Ex expand or protect and to preserve Israel's Jewish identity. So these foreign governments are hiding behind these NGOs that were founded because the Supreme Court effectively invited them to begin operations when it lowered or eliminated standard, uh, I mean, standing requirements to petition the Supreme Court. So as the Supreme Court radicalized Israel's deep state, our permanent bureaucracy, our permanent government, through the uh, everything is justiciable uh, concept banner, um, the requirement of actually limiting the powers of the Supreme Court, of reining in Israel's legal fraternity, which until tonight had limitless powers, became more and more apparent and more and more urgent uh, for Israel to survive in the long term as the Jewish state and as a democracy, which you have separation of powers and it's where people go to the ballot and they elect people to lead the country in line with their values and the nation's interests. So as the left radicalized more and more, the permanent bureaucracy, which is dominated and has been dominated by the left since the founding of Israel became more and more radicalized. And it was only because of the radicalization, not because they opposed Likud, because of the radicalization of the left and of the left inside of the permanent state of Israel that the requirement to actually rein them in through reform became so pressing. And what we saw today was a first step towards reforming a system that has been screaming out for reform and placement of limits on its power. Now, I would say for decades, I've been writing about the issue of the Supreme Court and of the, the legal fraternity, our attorney general, which also has unlimited power for 20 years or more. And um, so for me, it's a very sweet victory. And one last thing I wanna say about that, um, we still have a long road ahead of us before the counter-revolution, if you will, if the democratic restoration of Israel is to go forward. We have a lot of obstacles in, in our path, but for me and for many, many other Israelis who have been working for this for decades, uh, this is a moment to relish. 
And just to give you a sense of the stakes. So this morning, the day started in Israel uh, with anarchists who were aping Antifa, many of them wearing and, you know, wear Antifa masks, uh, not this morning, but in other uh, actions that they have taken, barricading the doors of uh, Tali Gottlieb, uh, Likud, a member of Knesset, an outspoken champion of judicial reform, a trial lawyer herself until she was elected, criminal uh, a criminal defense attorney, and uh, education minister Yoav Kish. Both of them live in apartment buildings. The leftist agitators entered their buildings, sat down in the hallways of their of floors in the, you know, outside the door of their apartments, inside of their apartment building, and tried to block them from being able to leave their homes and go to the Knesset to vote this morning. And in the case of Tali Gottlieb, she has a special needs daughter, um, who's very, very uh, low functioning, um, and they terrified her. Uh, the mother, Tali Gottlieb, who is a lawmaker, but she's also a mother, was pleading with them to leave, and they refused and effectively said that she was under house arrest. Um, we had member of Knesset, Ramban Barak, uh, for the second time now, uh, comparing the government and the Knesset to Nazi Germany, um, and on and on and on uh, in terms of the provocations. Ehud Barak, uh, former prime minister and chief of staff of the army, of uh, almost all but openly calling for uh, violence against Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in a tweet, um, you know, and and this is just the kinds of things that we're facing now in Israel. The left is truly out of control. The radical left is out of control, and unfortunately, the political leaders of the left, Yair Lapid, Benny Gantz, and others, are either part of the mob or too afraid of the mob to stand up to them. So they're not standing with. President uh, Yitzhak Herzog, who is also a leftist, but unlike uh, the Knesset leaders, uh, at least right now, for now, is not paralyzed by fear of the mob, and he's trying to reach compromise. And so, you know, we're seeing we're seeing um, a fight. We saw it this this evening in the Knesset. It was met, and that the elected government and Knesset stood up to the mob for their part, and pass through the beginning of a long process of legal reform in Israel that is years overdue, decades overdue. It's finally being done because it must be done. It must be done. And we're blessed to be led today by men and women who are courageous, who are willing to stand up, who understand the stakes and are not standing down. And we should wish them Godspeed as they continue this. They deserve all of our support. Everybody who loves democracy, everybody who wants to preserve Israel as a Jewish state should be applauding their courage and their efforts and should be cheering them on as they go forward through compromise and also through stubborn insistence to see this work through. It is the most important thing on the agenda uh, domestically. It influences everything that we do abroad, um, which as we're going to turn to now with David uh, uh, Goldman, uh, it's clear that the stakes are rising by the day also outside of Israel's gates because of the, not only the regional situation with Iran, but also because of the global situation, uh, which is reflected so strongly by the bitter strategic realities unfolding in Ukraine today a year after the Russian invasion. But for Israelis, this is a moment to savor. And uh, for Friends of Israel, this is a moment to savor and celebrate. So a little bit of good news. And now um, I'm going to move to my interview with David Goldman to talk about the realities that Israel faces as we restore our democracy and preserve our Jewish identity and our democracy uh, for the generations to come. 